Welcome to Mega 10. I am Monica. And I'm David. A quick reminder, please give us a like, hit the bell, and subscribe to our channel. You can also join the VIP front row to get early access to all our upcoming videos. Thank you for being here and supporting us. Okay, David. I think today's topic takes us right into the heart of Ripple's transformation, especially this whole strategic pivot towards stablecoins. It's not just about payments anymore. It's about reshaping how global liquidity actually moves. Exactly, Monica. What we're really seeing is Ripple evolving from being a cross-border payments company into something more like a global settlement infrastructure. RLUSD, their dollar-backed stablecoin, is the centerpiece of that shift. It's what's redefining XRP's role from a volatile bridge asset into what analysts are now calling a settlement layer reserve instrument. Right. And I remember the early days when XRP was purely the bridge and on-demand liquidity, just hopping between currencies to avoid Nostro accounts. That worked fine, but it had volatility baked in. Now, with RLUSD, the idea is to pair that bridge with something stable enough for central banks, treasuries, and big institutions. XRP doesn't disappear. It becomes the underlying layer, keeping liquidity flowing across across corridors. It's interesting because in multi-CBDC environments where national digital currencies are popping up everywhere, XRP might end up being the neutral reserve sitting underneath, a kind of programmable version of gold in Bretton Woods terms. And the data points back it up. Ripple's research shows tokenized assets could hit around $19 trillion by 2033, with XRPL as the neutral layer tying everything together. So even though stablecoins like RLUSD are front and center, XRP's evolving utility might actually expand rather than shrink. That's a subtle but powerful point. The bridge asset becomes the reserve, and RLUSD becomes the compliant wrapper for institutional adoption. You can think of RLUSD as the regulatory face, and XRP as the engine underneath. Yes, and what's quite clever is the design of RLUSD itself. It's fully backed one-to-one -one with U.S. dollar reserves held with custodians like BNY Mellon and with monthly attestations. That transparency is exactly what regulators, especially under Mika in Europe, are demanding. <laughs> Which is why RLUSD is so different from central bank digital currencies. CBDCs are sovereign liabilities. They sit directly on the central bank balance sheet. RLUSD is private, backed by fiat reserves and operating across multiple public ledgers, XRPL and Ethereum at the start. That's the kind of interoperability most CBDCs won't have for years. The contrast is sharp. CBDCs are about policy and control. RLUSD is about speed and flexibility. Ripple's model has the advantage of neutrality, and that's crucial if you want to link up different national currencies without stepping on sovereign toes. It fits perfectly with BIS and IMF roadmaps that talk about interlinked systems rather than one global currency. XRPL provides that interlink, especially with its native DEX and AMM integration. Instant atomic swaps between assets mean no correspondent delays, no reconciliation risk, just deterministic finality in seconds. Speaking of correspondent banking, the way Ripple's rebuilding that architecture is fascinating. They've effectively mirrored it, but made it tokenized. In the old world, you had banks holding Nostro and Vostro accounts to manage liquidity across borders. Ripple Stack replaces those accounts with digital trust lines, AMM pools, and programmable escrows. And that's where their acquisitions fit in. Medico brought institutional custody. Standard custody added trust company permissions, and now the hidden road deal extends them into prime brokerage. Ripple's financial stack now spans from custody to settlement. It looks more like a global market utility than a fincac. The efficiency gains are massive. No more capital trapped in pre-funded accounts, settlements in seconds instead of days, and real-time tracking. They've basically recreated the correspondent network as a synchronous, tokenized version that can settle FX, securities, and stablecoins in one place. But with that power come new challenges. For example, how do central banks manage monetary policy if a big chunk of liquidity starts circulating through private stablecoins instead of deposits? That's where things get tricky. Coexistence between public stablecoins like RLUSD and private bank tokens could change how policy transmits. When money moves outside the banking system, the traditional levers, interest rates, reserve ratios, lose some bite. Exactly. The ECB's recent papers even mentioned that tokenized liquidity could accelerate transmission in some channels, but weaken it in others. You get faster velocity, but less predictability. It's a double-edged sword. And if you think about scale, imagine every G20 country issuing a stablecoin either directly or bridged through XRPL. The liquidity implications are 
enormous. We're talking about a 10 to $20 trillion expansion in circulating digital cash equivalents. Which could boost global trade efficiency, but also create systemic risk if something deep pegs. The IMF's warnings about stablecoin concentration make sense in that context. If too much settles through one ledger, you end up with single point of failure risk. True, though Ripple's approach to governance seems designed to prevent that. The XRPL validator structure is federated. No mining, no staking, and consensus changes are handled through amendments with community voting. It's fast, but still distributed enough to avoid central capture. And under Mika, Regulators can even throttle usage if non-domestic stablecoins exceed certain thresholds. That acts as a built-in check against dominance by any one network. So technically, XRPL could host multiple national stablecoins without breaking policy autonomy. The governance story is evolving, but I find the compliance transformation equally impressive. Ripple's built an entire identity stack into XRPL. Decentralized identifiers, verifiable credentials, permission domains, and even deep freeze functions for sanctions enforcement. It's what regulators have been asking for. Instead of ignoring KYC and AML, they've made it programmable. Credentials allow institutions to prove compliance without over-disclosing data. And Deep Freeze lets issuers respond instantly to sanctions events. That's something no first-generation blockchain ever handled natively. The integration of RegTech into the protocol is quietly revolutionary. It means institutional settlements can stay on public rails without compromising compliance. If anything, it might even reduce costs by automating what's usually manual. And as RLUSD adoption grows, those compliance features become crucial. Right now, reports show the stablecoin already surpassing a billion dollars in monthly volume across more than 50 countries, still small in macro terms, but growing steadily. It's that early scalability stage that tells us a lot. So far, XRPL's throughput of 1,500 transactions per second and 12 years of uptime look more than enough. The challenge will come when volume scales by an order of magnitude. Which is why they're working on performance optimizations and sidechains. The mainnet handles global settlement, while specialized chains take on high-volume niches like remittances or tokenized credit markets. It's modular, not monolithic. That modularity helps with systemic risk management, too. If one segment experiences stress, it doesn't freeze the whole network. Plus, XRPL's built-in circuit breaker logic, the deep freeze function, can act as a stabilizer. And from a legal standpoint, Ripple is still benefiting from that 2023 court ruling. The decision that programmatic XRP sales weren't securities gave them enough breathing room to expand RLUSD without constant litigation fear. Although, as you said earlier, the clarity is partial. Institutional sales were still classified differently, and the SEC's penalty process carried on for a while. But at least it proved Ripple could operate within existing regulatory frameworks. Just a reminder, remember to like, share, and subscribe. And also, don't forget there is a front row seat waiting for you. Join us here at the VIP area. Thank you, Monica. That clarity opened the door for new licensing, too. They're now registered in Singapore, licensed in Dubai, and recognized under UK's FCA regime. That multi-jurisdictional footprint is essential if RLUSD is going to move beyond the US market. The European side is especially relevant given Mika's rules on electronic money tokens. RLUSD fits that profile neatly. Transparent reserves, attested monthly, compliant custody, all of which are prerequisites for approval. What's fascinating is how Ripple's balance sheet discipline is starting to influence others. They've set a model for how stablecoin issuers can behave like regulated banks, segregating reserves, using top-tier custodians, and publishing attestations. That's why central banks might actually use Ripple's model as a reference when designing their own digital cash instruments. It's a blueprint for trust, even if it's still private money. And with that comes new forms of credit creation. XRPL's programmable escrows now support tokenized assets, meaning stablecoins can be locked, collateralized, or even rehypothecated. It opens doors to tokenized lending, but also introduces shadow banking concerns if it scales too fast. Exactly. Regulators will want transparency on ownership rights and segregation. Otherwise, tokenized credit could recreate old risks in a new wrapper. But if done properly, it could make cross-border credit far more efficient. It's also why Ripple's architecture resonates with the BIS's idea of interoperable wholesale CBDC networks. XRPL already ticks most boxes. Atomic payment versus payment, deterministic settlement, shared rulebook potential. It's practically a live model of what the BIS keeps describing. And Ripple's acquisitions feed that direction. Between custody, compliance, and tokenization, they're moving toward being a global utility rather than a niche fintech. The resemblance to SWIFT's institutional footprint is uncanny, but with far more speed and programmability. 
Still, geopolitics remains the wild card. If XRPL becomes the neutral rail connecting both sanctioned and non-sanctioned economies, it's bound to attract scrutiny. The U.S. Treasury will insist that OFAC rules follow the token wherever it goes. That's unavoidable. The key will be how much compliance automation Ripple can build in. Public transparency helps, but obligations still fall on issuers and intermediaries. Meanwhile, developing nations could either benefit massively or be sidelined. If G20 stablecoins dominate corridors, liquidity might concentrate in strong currencies again, leaving smaller economies dependent on external digital money. To avoid that, Ripple and multilateral institutions like the IMF would need to promote local currency stablecoins and subsidized gateways. Equitable access requires intentional design. Otherwise, tokenization just repeats the same global imbalances. Which brings us to one of the big philosophical shifts here. Ripple isn't trying to overthrow the system. It's trying to merge with it. Instead of replacing central banks, it's giving them rails that already work at global scale. And that's what makes the timing so important. Every major central bank is now deep into CBDC pilots. The BIS says over 90% are experimenting. The ones that prioritize interoperability will likely end up interacting with XRPL at some point. It's an inevitable convergence. Ripple's stack doesn't ask them to abandon sovereignty. It just offers a more efficient substrate. The more compliant and transparent RLUSD proves to be, the easier that integration becomes. From a macro liquidity perspective, that could mean faster monetary transmission, real-time trade settlement, and near-instant FX conversion. But it also means central banks will have to rethink their measurement tools, GDP velocity, money multipliers, all of it. True, when settlement finality collapses from days to seconds, economic activity looks different. The challenge will be to manage that speed without amplifying shocks. That's where governance and systemic safeguards come in. We're already seeing circuit breaker-like features at the protocol level, reserve stress testing for issuers and prudential exposure limits for banks under Basel guidelines. So even though the system's moving faster, the controls are getting tighter. The regulators seem to be learning alongside the technology this time. The real test will be crisis performance. How the ledger behaves under stress, liquidity crunches, large redemptions, regulatory interventions. That's what will determine its credibility as financial infrastructure. Absolutely. But so far, XRPL's 12-year uptime and zero major security breaches give it an enviable track record. It's quietly become one of the most reliable distributed ledgers in finance. That reliability is exactly why Ripple is pushing to make XRPL the neutral bridge in multi-CBDC corridors. Imagine one ledger interlinking the digital euro, e-yen, and e-dollar, all with atomic settlement and compliance baked in. That's not as far-fetched as it sounded a few years ago. Between BIS's Project M-Bridge and the IMF's experiments with digital SDRs, global institutions are already testing similar ideas. XRPL could simply be the public-private variant that moves faster. It's also worth noting that Ripple is not limiting itself to Western corridors anymore. Their expansion into Asia, the Middle East, and Africa shows where real transaction volume growth will come from, high remittance economies. Those regions need stable infrastructure that doesn't rely on volatile intermediaries. XRLUSD fills that cap, giving them dollar-equivalent liquidity while keeping transactions compliant and instantaneous. And for local economies, using XRPL could reduce remittance costs dramatically. Some estimates show potential savings of up to 50% compared to traditional rails. That's life-changing for households relying on overseas income. It's also macro-significant for developing economies where remittances make up a large share of GDP. Just a reminder, remember to like, share, and subscribe. And also, don't forget, there is a front-row seat waiting for you. Join us here at the VIP area. Thank you, Monica. Coming back to the structural side, I find it fascinating how the native AMM on XRPL now acts like a dynamic monetary router. Multi-denominational pools can handle USD, EUR, CNY, and others in a single atomic transaction. That routing capability effectively makes XRP the grease in the global liquidity engine. It ensures that even when one pool dries up, auto-bridging finds the cheapest path through another. And when you replace RippleNet's off-ledger messaging with those on-ledger primitives, you remove entire layers of reconciliation. Payments, FX, and settlement all become one atomic event. It also improves transparency. Every leg of the transaction is auditable on-chain, yet sensitive identity details remain protected through credentials. That's a major advancement over legacy SWIFT messages, which often lack real-time traceability. It's not hard to imagine banks gradually replacing old systems with XRPL-based processes as regulatory comfort grows. The infrastructure is already capable. It's just a matter of policy catching up. And when it does, 
Ripple could effectively become the first global market utility built on blockchain, privately operated but publicly verifiable. Which would make sense given their acquisitions. Custody from Medico, compliance from Standard Custody, Prime Services from Hidden Road, it's all converging into a one-stop infrastructure for tokenized finance. The geopolitical implications, though, will keep policymakers awake at night. If neutral infrastructure like XRPL starts connecting sanctioned and non-sanctioned economies, enforcement frameworks will need to adapt quickly. True, but complete isolation isn't sustainable either. Financial networks thrive on inclusion, not fragmentation. The challenge is building programmable compliance into the network itself, which Ripple's already doing. For developing nations, inclusion will depend on equitable access. They'll need to be liquidity pools in local currencies, not just the big ones. Otherwise, tokenization could reinforce existing inequalities. That's where international partnerships come in. The IMF, World Bank, and regional development banks could integrate XRPL corridors into aid and trade finance structures. That would balance liquidity between North and South. So in a way, Ripple's architecture could become the backbone for the next phase of financial inclusion. Programmable, compliant, and fast. And looking ahead, as tokenized FX markets mature, Ripple settlement primitives could eliminate T plus 2 risk entirely. Instant PVP settlement would mean less capital tied up and fewer systemic exposures. That's huge for global trade. And when credit markets adapt too, using tokenized escrows for cross-border loans, we'll see a complete shift in how capital flows are managed. But again, it'll need clear governance. Rehypothecation of tokenized assets can't turn into unregulated shadow banking. Transparency and disclosure will make or break trust. That's why Ripple's reserve attestation model matters so much. It's not just good optics, it's operational proof that transparency and compliance can coexist on public infrastructure. In short, Ripple's pivot to stablecoins has repositioned XRP from being a tool for liquidity to being part of the global financial architecture itself. And RUSD is the bridge that makes that architecture palatable to regulators and institutions. The next few years will show whether this hybrid model becomes the standard for interoperable finance. Either way, the implications are immense. Cross-border settlement, FX, credit, and policy transmission are all converging onto programmable ledgers. XRPL just happens to be one of the most mature examples ready to scale. It feels like the early internet of finance, fragmented but rapidly aligning around open standards and compliance frameworks. Agreed. And those who understand the intersection of technology, regulation, and liquidity today will be the ones shaping the future of monetary infrastructure tomorrow. Drop comments below and subscribe to our channel. David and I are personas to make content more engaging and relatable, not legal and financial advice. Do your own research before making any investment decisions. By the way, Keep an eye on the next BIS and IMF joint papers about cross-border digital settlements. They often signal where regulations are heading months before markets react. Reading them early can help you anticipate future shifts. See you next time.